Yeah. Hey, I'm Felix, or I think most people know me as XQ or XQ, depending on how you spell it. Uh, I'm going to talk about using Zig only as a tool chain to build C projects. I was having a new uh, project approaching and I wanted to solve it so other people can benefit from it. And yeah, that's what originated from the talk. So first, some words to my person. Uh, I'm Felix Weisner with this weird letter in the middle that's actually a German only letter. It's not anywhere else in any like German language. No, the Swiss don't use it. The Austrian people don't use it. Only the Germans, I don't know. So I'm an embedded software engineer. I started as a C-sharp hobby developer some years ago. Then somehow found Zig, uh, got addicted, and still struggling with that addiction. <laughs> I also started to be a wannabe hardware designer, currently building several devices. Uh, no idea if they're working, we'll see. And you may have used a package of mine if you have used Zig before. So I've done a networking library, I have several game dev libraries, uh, argument parsing, whatever you name it, you find it probably from me. Uh, I'm also with the uh, hardware designer stuff and the embedded software engineer. We found that, micro, uh, that Zig is really well suited for microcontrollers, so we started to do micro Zig or the Zig embedded group. Uh, together with uh, Vizim and Matt Knight, who organized the wonderful conference this year. So what I'm going to talk about today is a short introduction into C development and what is the status quo of C and how does the world look like. Then I'm going to present my project I was developing, which is called API Jam or APGEM. I'm talking a bit about how to build C projects with Zig and how to write C in a more Zig style, which is what I discovered in that process of doing that tool. And at the end, a small summary for you. So, how do we build, or first, a short disclaimer, uh, I have basically no code on my slides because the build code is often long and Either it wouldn't fit the slide or it wouldn't be really helpful. I tried to reduce the code samples so you can actually make sense of them on the slides. So status quo on C projects. Uh, I tried to build two pretty widespread projects called Bison and Flex some days ago and it was a really horrible uh, experience because I was not having auto tools installed and if you try to do that well, it's an experience, and if you try to figure out how that project is actually built, well, good luck. We have a vast landscape of different build tools, we have different compilers, uh, people organize projects in whatever way they came up with or copied from a previous project they did or whatever. So a C project is, well, I can do C, but I have no idea how your project works. And every project is a new learning experience. And right now we have uh, build, build systems for C. We have uh, Make, CMake, PreMake, AutoTools, MSBuild, you name it. I think if you had to do with native development, you know at least one of those. So the thing is, each of those uses different kinds of describing your project. AutoTools doesn't work on Windows, the first thing. Well, <laughs> so it's out to root out. We have MS Build, which mostly works only on Windows. Uh, also, it's only XML. It's horrible to read, it's horrible to write, it's horrible to maintain if you don't use Visual Studio. If you use Visual Studio, you can't maintain the files anymore by hand. So, well, we have PreMake, which is somehow using Lua for describing builds, and I had only a short contact with it and basically discarded it as a viable tool for me because it was super un, like, opaque, you couldn't see what was going on. We have CMake, uh, who here has used CMake before? I'm sorry. <laughs> who here has liked it? <laughs> yeah, okay, so we all know it, we all use it. Basically, right now it's the best solution we have to build C projects and still I'm fucking horrible. <laughs> uh, 
we can use make, classic new make or the Unix make. It works, it's actually quite portable, but it's also like super tedious to use. Like writing make files by hand, you don't have dependency tracking for C headers, except you're like either writing all the header dependencies by hand into your make file, or you're like generating make files in your build step to generate dependencies and then nobody understands your build script anymore. And we have Ninja, which is actually pretty cool, but only if you use it as a backend for CMake because writing Ninja files by hand has the same problems, but is even less made for humans. So yeah, building software in C is a wild, wild world, and well, there's a new game. We have SIG with a build system, which is pretty cool for that. And in the C world, we also have a good bunch of compilers Luckily, GCC and Clang mostly agree on how C code or C++ code should look like. They have their tiny differences, like LLVM or Clang assumes that an endless loop without side effects can just be optimized away to nothing. So if you write embedded code, and GCC doesn't do that optimization, so if you write embedded code and you're like, oh yeah, let's just hang CPU, we can't proceed here, and you write like just while true, nothing more, yeah, well, in Clang, that gets optimized away and your code runs whatever is coming after that in memory. Wonderful. We also have the Microsoft compiler, which can't even compile C. It pretends to. Actually, it's a C++ compiler that has a flag to remove all the C++ features from the language, but not semantics. So, <laughs> with, with C, you can actually do type punning via unions. With MSPC, it's not possible. It just doesn't allow that. It's C++ semantics, so in C++ it's not allowed to do that, in C it is allowed. We have also other compilers like the tiny CC compiler, which is cool because it's small, it's fast, and it doesn't optimize. Uh, it also doesn't support that many architectures, so yeah. Then we have uh, Zig, which is a tool chain, a new programming language. Uh, we have a language that respects C heritage, and we also came with a build system that can luckily build C projects pretty much without any work put into the build process, which is amazing. And the, the tool chain ships a C compiler. It also ships a libc, or like it's more than one libc actually. So if you go on the system, you download zip, you type zip build exe dash lc for linking with c, your c file, press enter, it will probably work, and you will have an executable that will work, and you just installed a single dependency for all your development environment. Nice, including the build system. So I was taking the adventure of building a new tool that is uh, supporting me and probably people in <laughs> what they're doing, because a lot of projects like native libraries expose on API boundary, expose APIs. And we want to use those APIs in C, we want to use them in Zig. Luckily, we can import C headers in Zig, so that's no problem. But we also want to use them in Python, we want to use them in Rust, in Java, in C Sharp, in Lua, whatever you name it. And the only process I know right now for that is writing each binding by hand, which is tedious, which is error prone. And a lot of people use solutions like, hey, let's pre-compile our headers to whatever intermediate state from C, because that's what we have as a source data. And that's not really the way I want to go, because it's imprecise. And with SIG, I learned that we have a way more precise modeling for uh, native types. So I created a tool to exactly do that. We have a language that looks Surprisingly like Zig, but isn't. This is actually not a programming language, it's a markup language for uh, APIs. So you can declare functions, you can declare types, you can declare your opaque types, like in Zig, which you can only point to. You can make your own optional pointers and so on. And API Chain will take that definition, will semantically analyze it, will also uh, talk to you about how bad it is to use cint and it would be better to use like a real defined integer that is the same size on all platforms and so on. And then you can 
use that tool to compile this to a C sharp binding, to a Lua binding, to whatever. Right now, as you can see, I have only implemented a zig generator and a C generator, but we can also do a C generator without much work. It's, I think it's 800 lines per of C code per code generator, which is quite maintainable. Uh, and another idea is what I've built in. I also included the idea of the doc comment, comments of SIG, so you can actually build HTML documentation from the API definition instead of like using DocsyJam. <coughs> well, I have one big problem right now is I can't generate implementations. So for zip code, I would generate a binding, then take that binding and manually change everything from ex in, uh, extern into export and implement those functions myself and do that every time I regenerate the API, which is tedious. And I need to find a way around that. So some of you probably know that me, right? <laughs> so yeah, I was aware of that. I'm creating a new standard with that tool to scrape APIs. I actually proposed to the SDL project to start using a similar approach without like with that tool in mind, but like not like just a general it would be super cool to have a machine readable, well defined description of the C SDL SPIs, the S API so we can use generators to generate our bindings easier and more correct. So now I have a tool that I can actually propose to them so they can use it. Uh, yeah, I've talked about that already a bit. So we have these project specific tools like whatever parse C files, convert them to whatever. In this case, I also can't translate C from Zig. It's also one of those project specific tools that are not really portable outside the same project. Or we have, uh, what I've also seen is API definitions in JSON, XML, Lua, whatever, you have like a self-made domain specific language to solve that. That is also only half-baked and yeah. That's the reason I decided to make this tool and try to solve that problem for a lot of people in a non-project non -like specific way. Uh, also, why is the tool written in C instead of SIG? I'm a huge fan of SIG, but uh, C is still the most portable language we have. It is basically supported everywhere. The tool uses only the C standard library, so we're safe on portability as long as you have a C standard library. It will build. I have no configuration flags. I have no defines you need, whatever. It will just build Take all files, use them at a C compiler, it will compile, it will work, you're happy. I have dependencies on Flex and Bison because I use them to generate a uh, lector and parser for my language, but those are weak dependencies. You can use the tooling to just say, give me those generated files from those tools, I will just bundle them and render them without having to ever invoke those Flex and Bison again. And yeah, that's, so the main idea of the project is to make it in C, so people can just trip it with their tool, trip it with their engine. So it's not a big deal to generate headers for contributors to those projects. They don't need to install APGen. They can just use the normal build process, whatever it uses. And yeah, let's talk about a bit about how I use the build script and the overall thing is that the build.zig file is a declarative interface, similar to a lot of other build systems, except for we use regular zig code to declare everything in the build. The build system creates a directed async wrap of build steps, which are mostly compilations of code. We can use <laughs> run steps to execute arbitrary executables in steps that will generate files and consume files so we can integrate them into caching and everything. And we can also at the end of the build chain uh, just install files into our prefix to get results. Like if I do sig build, I get a folder <coughs> called sig out slash bin where the 
API trans executable is located. Everything's fine, it works, works the same on every machine. So this is overall a pretty cool build system. And for building C projects, we have wonderful functions here. We have the app executable, which will create a new executable. We can also use app shared library or add static library or add object to create new types of uh, binary artifacts. For building C, we should use the call dot link with C, which will link the C library for that system. And it will automatically select the right C library. If I do a cross compile for Windows, I will get a Windows C library that will work. Same for macOS, even on whatever I'm on a Linux with x86 and I build for macOS with ARM64 and it will work, which is really, really nice. Then the, I think two most important functions are at C source file and at C source files, which can be used to, well, what the name says, we can add our source file to the compiler. They will automatically do all the header dependency tracking for us, which is wonderful, takes away all of that work, and it's really reliable. I've never seen it fail. We also have the app include path and, path and app library path to uh, give the compiler hints about where it finds the headers, where we can find libraries, and so on. If we use external libraries, external headers, or also internal headers. And then there's a pretty, pretty uh, powerful tool that's called Link System Library. This will actually use PackageCon or VC package, depending on your host platform to build to fetch uh, dependencies. So if you link STL, you can just type in Link System Library STL, and it will actually search for the correct library on your system. If you've installed it via VC package on Windows, it will just link it, and it will work. This is super nice. And I also don't have to care, like, does the system support that? Uh, that function will take care of it. With the 0 0.11 release, we got a link system library 2 function, <laughs> which takes an additional argument that will allow me to control how that linking works. I can say, skip all that auto magic stuff, just put the name on a linker and ignore everything else, or fail the build if you actually don't find a package config for that library. This is pretty useful uh, if you want to be a bit more specific, but it's often just not needed. And I've said I'm using Flex and Bison, and those tools generate several files in the build that may or may not change. And we don't want to recompile the whole project if I just add a comment in my Bison file and don't want to regenerate everything. So we need dependency tracking for that. And I honestly have no idea how I would solve this. For example, in CMake, that's no idea how to do that. I would just accept that it would recompile because it's probably on long term still less time wasted than figuring out how to do it in CMake. And for ZIG, we have a concept that's called lazy path. We can check that. Can I point here? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, so first thing is I use the add system command to add a invocation of flex to the build. This doesn't mean it gets run, it just is a declaration of I want to execute that executable at a point in time. And then I have just add some arguments to configure flex. APGen uses, I think, 15 or so. I reduced that to make it slightly compatible here. And then are the actual magic calls, which is at output file arc and uh, down below the at file source arc, which are now uh, called a bit different in 0 0.11. I should update those. They allow us to, the output file arc allows us to declare that this command will eventually generate a file that is roughly called that. It will be somewhere in the in the build cache. So if you run the tool, it will generate that file and it will provide a path to a file which we can get a handle on. That's the Lexer C source and Lexer H source are both not file paths, but like handles on a future file path. And 
this is super useful, and I'm constructing a similar future in the next line that at file source arc takes such a future. And I'm just saying, okay, that future will have that log value, and SIG will now automatically detect that the input of this generation or this execution is the uh, this file. So if I ever change that file, it will automatically rerun the flex command. Otherwise, it will just store all generated files with the so these two, and will fetch them from the cache instead instead of uh, running flex again. This is really, really useful. And I can then go on and say, add the file I generated above to the compiler. And now I added a edge in my graph that will make a dependency. So if I now compile exe, I will actually run flex before if I have to, because the Elixir C source carries the information of that step has to be ran before actually the before I can actually compile the exe. Same goes for the add include path, which uses the dir name feature that is currently not in <laughs> 0 0.11. There's a open pull request for that. Uh, I have a manual implementation of that in my build.sig file. It's not that much code actually, so it doesn't hurt. And this is super cool to generate any stuff in your build. If you have pre-processing, post-processing, on embedded converting binaries or like L files to binaries, it's just another add system command, object copy, input file is whatever the compiler needed at me. Output file is a lazy path and I can just take that path and install it. And if I ever call install, it will call the object copy, which will then in turn has already invoked the compilation of my executable. So we have all of this dependency tracking built into the build system and for me, the huge benefit of this is that I can now work with paths I don't have to declare. Uh, building, building artifacts, intermediate artifacts, I don't want to give them a name, I don't want to give them a directory, I don't want to care, I just know this command outputs something I need to input into this command and after that the file is gone, I don't need it anymore, it's just temporary and the build system allows me to express this wonderfully and also type safe. So if I make a typo in a temporary path, it will take me probably minutes to hours to figure out what went wrong, especially if a file with that name already exists. So, yeah. My tool, the API gen, can also comes with a huge test suit and I can also use the lazy path stuff to model that test suite. For example, to test all the, I have a lot of example files that are basically modeling the good path of this is a valid file for API gen. And I validate that by converting each of those files into zig and into C, and then shoving both of these files into the zig compiler to validate that it actually compiles. So, if I do zig build test, I will actually know if everything I generated is valid C code, is valid zig code, and if it won't pass, I know I have created any compiler error anywhere to generate the code. And this is making uh, trust into the tool pretty high for me, so I can just know the code that is generated is working. Uh, so another feature of SIG is cross-compilation, and who here has tried to use a non-SIG toolchain with cross-compilation? Who had fun? <laughs> so, yeah, before the talk, oh, should I pause? Do you want the power bank? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. Where's my cable? Sorry. 
Charge up a bit before it can. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, let's. Uh, so <laughs> let's just back up. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll just that one. So uh, you can continue okay. as you were. Yeah. So on the story of cross compilation, um, while making the slides for this talk, I tried doing some cross compilations, like <coughs> six different targets, just worked. Change the target, press enter, wait 10 seconds, you have a binary for the target. It's crazy. Like, I've never had this little work to set up a cross compilation tool chain. Just did work. And <laughs> the only problem I have right now with API chain, you can actually only compile on Linux or any other Unix OE because Flex and Bison don't support Windows. <coughs> this is, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful, like choosing a tool and then figuring out that a tool is definitely not the right tool for that task. And what I also learned while doing the slides, we actually have 64 different kinds of libc shipped with zip. So a lot of the stuff is basically Linux with both GNU and Muscle linking, so or ABI, so we have static linking by default or dynamic linking by default which is pretty cool, but there's also a lot of interesting stuff within it. For example, we can compile to Vasi or and just run our C code on WebAssembly and we'll also just magically work and we'll just compile and yeah. So each project has at a certain point dependencies. In my case, I have Flex and I have Bison. You actually don't need to have Flex installed if you build API Chen because I'm using a Zig package manager and it will download Flex, it will build Flex, and it will run Flex for you, depending on a target platform. 
sadly with Bison, I gave up after like five hours of figuring out how to build Bison because I think it has like 10 files that are configured with auto tools and the macro list is like 250 macros in the end I have to undef or define or I just gave up and was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Better trip it in binary than building it ad hoc. This is this is madness. So yeah. For Flex, uh, actually the slide earlier led to you uh, my code book. It looks actually like that. So getting Flex is not passing it as a string, but passing it as an artifact from the yeah. Uh, package manager. So we use dependency to get a handle on a dependency I declare in the file above here. And that file will ship a build.sig file that will actually build flex. Then we can use uh, the, this dependency to fetch an artifact, which is also called flex. And we can run this artifact uh, and it will build it for our host machine and thus it will run a bit faster than the original flex because it's optimized for our current CPU instead of the uh, general purpose CPU, but I don't think that matters much in that case. <coughs> there are other tools where this can make a huge difference, for example if you go into machine learning or something and you want your tools to run with ABX 512 on your CPU and if you install it from anywhere in the net it will, build, it will be built as a generic tool or you have to like select which CPU features you want to enable on like download page or whatever. And if you build it with stake, it will just optimize it for your CPU and use all the features you have. This is also super cool. This is, by the way, also like a common like problem you have. Oh yeah, my executable works. I just type zig build, build from my machine. Let's just copy it on another machine. It will just not work at all. This is because the default build is usually for your CPU. And if you want to build a for a host that is generic, you have to actually do a cross-compile for your own architecture. So if you're on a uh, x86 laptop, for example, you have to build for x86 64 in Linux and do a cross-compile to get a generic portable executable. But yeah, after this, it was also pretty pleasant to just put in the dependency, type some lines of code, and get the install of Flex in the correct version out of hand because you need a pretty new version which isn't shipped with, for example, Debian. So if you're a Debian user, you would have need to build Flex by hand and now you don't. This is nice. Yeah. As I said earlier, we also have uh, custom steps in build.sig so we can do not only like type stick build and it will do something, but we can specify what we should do. In API Chan, I have four different commands. We have the install <coughs> command, which is the default one. We have a test, which will run the full test suite with all code generation. This will actually take a pretty good time for the first run because it will generate like 30 to 60 binaries, depending on how, you, how the test is currently set up. And as said, if you want to go with a source rendering of uh, APGen, you need the Flex and Bison files preprocessed. You can do that with SigBuild Generate. It will use the prefix and generate a source and include folder there that you can then use. Or if you're <coughs> super lazy, just do SigBuild Bundle and it will put, put every file you need to build APGen from Lords into the prefix and you can just copy paste that folder wherever you need it and it will work. So a quite shorter topic will come up, which is writing C with a good amount of SIG experience, because earlier writing C was pleasant, it was fun, writing C++ was also cool, but after like doing four or five years of SIG change to write C, it's really different now. I have different views on a lot of topics especially on error handling and like fault tolerance of your programs. So most of my code is using a lot of assertions, which we have sometimes built into SIG with like null pointer tracks and so on. 
Also, we have a lot of panics, and I'm starting to use no return way more than earlier, which was never. But it's so useful to be able to declare, for example, if you do a, a embedded system, just declare a main function no return, and now your compiler suddenly forces you to not return from main ever. So you basically have the guarantee that your program will either crash or <laughs> never like exit the regular code flow. And this is useful. So compiler will give an error if your program can return instead of like program will return and something will happen, but you don't really know what will happen or it should not return or the bug server, whatever. You can think of a lot of ways you can use that. Same as using way, way more explicit types than just everywhere using int or unsigned int. There's a good amount of stuff, uh, types you can use. There's uh, the standard int of h with size types like uint32. Underscore T, but there's also like U in pointer T, which is the actually only legal type to cast a pointer to to get a unique representation <laughs> can use. Uh, yeah. Also, we can uh, crank up the warning level on the C compiler. With Clang, we have the dash W everything, which is in every case too much, <laughs> but it's a good starting point to figure out which warnings are probably interesting in the code base. And in API chain, I have a pretty zigified warning style. So basically, all warnings are errors, and I have no shadowing in my code. I have no unused pa uh, parameters, so I have to explicitly ignore them, and so on in the code base. And it actually found a good amount of bugs in the code base when I enabled this. Also, I don't know. Who knows of the C99 named initializer list feature of C? Very good. This is uh, a lot of people write a lot of C and they never used it because they also use C++ and C++ doesn't have that. And basically the initializer list style for C is what we know from Zig. You can just write struct uh, then use a dot field name equals value instead of like remembering the order of fields in a struct, which is nobody's going to do that. And oh, someone swapped, swapped two fields and nobody will notice because the types are compatible. This will not happen with that. This is really, really convenient feature. Will sadly make your code not C++ compatible, but at that point, I don't care anymore. So <laughs> <coughs> in API chain, I also started to use uh, explicit I/O streams, which is basically a small library I built into the thing that is similar to what we have in Zig with uh, standard reader and standard writer. So I can also like use the same functions to print to a string or print to an array or print to a file. It doesn't matter. <coughs> it's more convenient if you want to like. Oh, I have to need. I need that stuff suddenly only in a string instead of like a file on disk and well, where do I get a file star for my uh, memory <coughs> area? It will work on Linux if you use GNU extensions and a memfd and there's a lot of stuff you can do but it's better to just use a, another file abstraction or IO abstraction from the start and that's what I did. I also started using arena allocators in C, uh, which makes the code from the bottom way more easy to manage because you can just do four of those allocations, then check if anyone failed, anything failed and return, and you're done and not don't need to like track which do I need to clean up. Okay, uh, variables fail, so I need to clean up functions and types and maybe anything that came before. And it's way way more convenient to use custom allocators or arena allocators in particular in C code. I also think only the arena stuff uses uh, malloc and free and the whole code base and everything else is used with stacked or nested arenas that will be free on demand. This makes everything a lot easier. Also, which is not very Zig style, I actually have an allocation failure defined as a panic. So 
if an allocation fails, I can't proceed to generate your code anyways, so I can just panic at that point and ignore that uh, any error handling strategies will just be printing into the user, so I can just do it in place anyways. Yeah, another thing that will be striking a lot of C programmers when using zip to compile C code is the undefined behavior sanitizer, which is enabled by default in debug modes. This is doing a lot of useful checks, like, oh, you're signed into the overflow at that point, and suddenly the program crashes. Sadly, Zig doesn't ship any <coughs> runtime for that, so it will literally just crash instead of print anything useful, but using a debugger uh, will point to the same location in code, and you usually find your button pretty quickly with that. Instead of like having it linger for years, and suddenly someone finds a remote code execution because you have signed into the overflow or whatever. We have, we have that enough in the world, so having the undefined behavior sanitizer enabled by default is really, really great. And yeah, we're at the end of my talk. Um, for me, uh, the Zig toolchain is really well suited to maintain and create new C projects. The build system is convenient. The features that are available, like UV Sun enabled by default, is really really nice. All the basically all the flags we want to set anyways are mostly set already and the, the defaults are saner than using a bare GCC or a Clang in the build. Also the batteries included environment with cross compilation with the same build environment on any machine I have is super awesome. For a lot of projects in my, with my case with Flex and Python it doesn't work but you basically you clone a repository with Zig, you type Zig build, it will build. And it doesn't matter if you're on Windows, if you're on Linux, if you're on Mac OS, if you're on a PSD variant, it will most likely work instead of like, oh no, I have the wrong CMake version installed and so on. This is for me a lot of this stuff is now gone in my personal projects. It will only require the semi half yearish update of a new version of Zig, which will eventually stop and then we can just continue building projects the same way forever. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so my conclusion is build new C projects with the Zig toolchain. It's awesome. And if you're interested in my tools or have any questions, there's a link to the tool repository. It's currently not finished, but it's definitely in a state where you can start writing your API definitions as long as you don't need alignment, for example, or certain uh, address spaces, which are features Zig pointers have, but I don't have included right now. I want to include alignment rules because it's important to have those in the API instead of like a document comment especially in stuff like Zeek, which can actually encode that stuff in type system. Yeah, so any questions? I was wondering about the C compilator or something for C, right? And then C, C lang is it can use it for C also? So Zeek bundles C lang. C, C lang compilator, is it? Is it's it, the uh, one that is used, yes. Okay. So it's not a custom C compiler, but it's uh, the full C lang. Chain. So there's nothing you have to like, no feature that needs to be left out. You have a full C lang at your hands that will compile C as <coughs> plus plus code. And what about arguments which depend on each other? <coughs> so you say you have a runtime parameter for length, and that is a, the array length is independent on. Yeah, as you might notice, I've taken a few notes during the default talk to with features we need to build into an API gen <laughs> that might come handy at one point. So what I've written is for me is um, constructor destructor style function. So we can annotate that for example malloc, a call to malloc has to eventually be called to a call to three, which is probably super awesome in a 
for example, if we generate Rust bindings. So Rust people will be happy if the that stuff will work. C++ people will be happy if they can use write properly with the generated code. Uh, what I also thought about, but I'm not sure if I want to include that, is generics. So we can express something like a list of integer instead, or like a list of t instead of like a list of integer, but I'm not sure if I want to include that in an ABI definition system, which can declare types and functions and not uh, basically not like constructs for C++ or C comp time. Also, uh, Another idea I had was the um, opaque handle type, which in Zig we use a empty enum, which can take all integer values. So we have a, a type safe integer handle or something like that. That will, I think, also be useful to express. And um, adding a way to dump the API definition to JSON or XML so people can process, as, process it with their own generators. Is it realistic to get uh, rid of uh, flex or, or bison in particular? Just to make like the build <laughs> instead of it uh, simpler. Uh, what do you mean? Like get rid of them like because you're using them for the parsing, right? Yeah, I can yeah. rewrite the parcel by hand. For yeah. Zig, I have my trusty parcel toolkit, which makes that task a lot easier. But I'm not aware of any like C tooling that is similar. And I don't really want to render generated files because they are not source files. That's basically a build artifact to generate the C code. Yeah. Hello. <clears throat> the, the only reason I've been able to build anything in SIG is because your awesome SIG build explained almost <laughs> that you uh, But now SIG uh, 0 0.11 is out, so now I can't build anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my question is, will we ever see a, a follow-up to that? Uh, that uh, yes, but I will wait at least one release cycle until I update because I have plans. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, there will be some changes. For example, the I did a pretty uh, quick refactor of the whole build system before 0 0.11, like a week before the release. I made a huge PR that renamed basically half of the functions into the same names. Like uh, a path source was renamed to lazy path, for example, and like we've seen the dir name function that will be available soon, but we don't have that right now, and this is all the stuff we need to handle in such a article again. And I want to finish all this stuff first, so we have another, another feature that's planned to get files from dependencies, which also has to be handled in the article, but it isn't there yet. I think that would have to be the last question. I think so. Yeah. Unfortunately, yes. uh, we're getting thrown out now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, thank you for the great talk. You're welcome. I will... Uh, Come up here with my selfie stick of sorts, <laughs> I guess. Or maybe, well, do you want to come up as well and say thank you? Can you hold this? <clears throat> thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, I think this is the end. This is like a, a minute to go, I think. So we timed it maybe a little, a little bit too narrowly, but it went fine in, in the end. Uh, thanks to everyone who gave such good talks. Uh, and found that we found like a theme this time to, you know, sort of. I was wondering, was that accidental or was <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, after it, it started to go in that way, and then we said, okay, let's really, really go that yeah. way. That was great. Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't really know when the next meetup will be because I'm adding a third child pretty soon. Who knows? And what happens then, right? Uh, so, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, uh, we'll see when and where that happens. But yeah, anyways, uh, and also I would like to say thank you for traveling all the way here yes. from Germany. It's really nice. It's nice to here. see Stockholm for the first time. So, even if it's a really short stay, like less than 24 hours, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, really 
big thanks to Loris and Andrew for actually sponsoring this trip. Yeah, so I actually only have to pay for food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So as I mentioned before, the, the tour is closed on Mondays. Yeah, so we recommend that. Yeah.